my name is Alan Herrera, and I am... I've spent a large part of my life making television documentaries, um, mostly history. Uh, so that has dominated everything. Um, I have, uh, by chance, in 1990, uh, became profoundly involved with the Coggy in Colombia. Uh, and that really was just one project out of many, except that the Coggy are not one project out of many. They are something that lifts you out of your world and takes you onto another planet. Uh, and this uh, is an experience which has never left me alone. So I have been with the Coggy intermittently ever since over what is now effectively a 30 year period. Uh, this is, of course, not the only thing I have done in that period. I have continued making historical documentaries um, for the BBC, mostly, on a fairly large scale, mostly. So covering big historical subjects in multi-part series. Uh, I've uh, also been writing history books, some of which have been are directly linked to the television series I've made, but not all of them. Um, from 1981, I've been writing history books that didn't necessarily have anything to do with television. So my first book was a social history of Britain from the middle of the 18th century. Um, and in all my work, I have been pursuing a single question which I started investigating before I left school, which is what happened to change our society into the kind of society it has become, with the kind of philosophy it has, with the kind of political structures it has, which was a transformation that happened, in my view, very quickly in the 17th century um, when the rug was pulled out from under our system of knowledge. It was dramatically changed, essentially, by Galileo. Um, I can explain that further, but that's not part of who I am. We don't necessarily have to do that. Um, but who I am is a guy who's been following that story and trying to get closer to it so that we can understand who we are. And I've been largely wasting my time because the impact, in my experience, of anything you do and show on television or write a book about on human consciousness is almost zero. So I keep going, uh, and it fascinates me and I'm intrigued by it, um, and I talk about it with enthusiasm and passion, but I don't think any of that leaves a mark on the world. And the only thing I've done that I honestly believe has left a mark on the world is that in the process of doing a series on the Crusades, I created a ball in the Venice Carnival uh, as a theatrical event for my film. And that ball, which was a phenomenon and the largest thing I've ever done, still continues to this day. The Doge's Ball in Venice is my legacy to humanity for what that's worth. I should say that the tickets are so expensive, I will never be able to afford to go to it. Let me give you the context, as you said when you were introducing the question to me, about Galileo. Um, it begins with my reading of Hannah Arendt when I was 17. And I was struck by her explanation of what got Descartes going. And what got Descartes going was Galileo and the realization that we do not know the world 
through our senses. For all of the history of the existence of humanity, this was the proposition, we have believed that we understand the world through our senses and that our senses speak the truth to us. Galileo's telescope reveals that our senses do not speak the truth to us, that we do not know stuff that's out there, that God has hidden information from us, and therefore we can't trust our senses, and this opens up Descartes' question of what do I know, his belief that he has to regard everything that is merely probable as false and to find a grounding for the idea of knowing anything at all. This has a fundamental impact on the consciousness of Western civilization. It is extraordinary how fast, I mean, it's in a matter of days that the British ambassador in, uh, I think it's in Rome, writes to King James in England, I think it's two days after the publication of Galileo's book, saying this is what this guy has said, and he's either going to change the world or be a prize idiot. It's staggering, the impact of what he does. Um, and it filters through into everything that happens, the entire political, intellectual structure, and also science, obviously. Um, and I was looking for many years for a way of exploring this story and investigating it and laying it out as a narrative, touching on all its different threads. And it was very hard because the key is to find a person who you can travel with on that journey. And eventually I found somebody who is a man called John Ogilby, who created the first road atlas the, in Britain and indeed anywhere else. That is an atlas of all the roads measured, carefully measured. Maps didn't used to have roads on them until the 1670s, 1675, when John Ogilby publishes Britannia. And Ogilby started life as a dance teacher. And he was teaching dance to lawyers in the Inns of Court in London, in Gray's Inn in particular. And the reason that they had to learn how to dance was that if they didn't dance on Saturday nights, they were thrown out of their employment. In order to practice law, you had to dance. And the reason you had to dance was because there was no law teaching. You didn't learn what law was. You learned the practice, the system, what you did in court. But actually to know that to steal is against the law. That didn't require teaching because you know that. Common law is something which is inbuilt into human beings. That was the theory. And the whole system of the universe is a single system of law. The same laws that hold the planets in their positions and move them around the Earth, because we're talking about pre-Galileo, those are the same laws that operate here on earth and give power to princes and to the church. Um, and so this was called, the dance was called Dancing the Old Measures, and every lawyer had to learn how to dance the old measures because by taking part in this dance, you were dancing the cosmology and internalizing natural law into yourself. Um, and that was an entire system of education. And you go through a process in which the whole political revolution happens, in which the kingdom falls, the king has his head cut off. Um, so the laws no longer give power to princes. Um, the, the heavens do not authorize royal power. Royal power disappears into the hands of men they are on a planet that goes round the sun. They are not the center of the universe. Everything is completely turned upside down. And uh, John Ogilby loses his living, obviously. He gets caught up in war. He gets caught up in the Thirty Years' War. 
he goes through a series of nine careers through what is actually the most dangerous century in the whole history of Britain, in which a higher percentage of the population die than in any other century by a combination of wars and disease, so that there is a constant wiping out of populations. And of course, London itself is completely destroyed in the Great Fire of London. And out of all this emerges a new civilization. And in this new civilization, John Ogilvy finds his place, bizarrely, as the royal cosmographer but the cosmography is utterly different from what it was. And his job is now to measure the kingdom. And so the old measures, which were the dance measures that linked to the stars and the planets, are now the new measures of feet and inches reproduced at one inch to the mile on paper. And he's invented a machine called a way wiser, which knows the way and which measures the revolutions of the wheel. And this is a revolution in every possible sense, including the fact that the Wayweiser relies on revolutions. Um, and that is part, writing that book was partly the culmination of my lifelong effort to find a way of telling this story. And I did it wrong. And the reason I did it wrong is that I have made the story a delight to read. So everybody gets entrapped in the life of the man. And nobody sees the big story through which he is dancing his life. Everybody just wants to turn the page to find out what happens next. That wasn't the point of the book. <laughs> Well, I didn't realize at first that the Coggy represented the pre-Galilean world, but of course they do. Um, and I hadn't quite cottoned on to start with, and there was so much going on in my encounter with the Coggy that it wasn't exactly the first of my questions. I mean, you have to imagine this situation in which you find yourself in the middle of a myth. The Coggy are part of our mythology. Um, we have this fantasy that one day there will emerge on a mountain top and a secret mountain in South America, a white robed people of infinite wisdom who will say, we have been watching you for centuries and we can see everything that you have been doing and doing wrong. And now it's time for us to emerge and to say, we are here to help. And that's exactly the situation I was in. I mean, it was insane. It was unreal. Here are these white-robed people. Here is what they're saying. And when I'm called to the house that, that we're going to start with, it begins with a voice in the back of the house, which houses about a hundred people sitting on the floor in the darkness around four fires. And this voice at the back says in Spanish, you have come to speak to us, so speak. And the blood runs cold. And I explain why I'm there and where I come from and that I make television programs and I have this camera that is an eye that remembers and an ear that remembers. And if they want to speak to the world, I can bring this. And it will be as though I'm bringing the whole world to the door of their house. But they're not there. They don't have to be intruded on, but they can speak to them. And that begins a process, which is absolutely amazing. And eventually I realize that there is a really interesting question here, which is, why are we not like them? they actually turn out to be much more like our ancestors than I had realized. They are not aliens. They're not people from another planet. They are people who have retained an ancestral understanding of the world that the rest of us have both forgotten and destroyed. And we have destroyed the cultures of other indigenous people who had similar cultures. Um, so then the question arises, well, what happened? How did we lose 
what they still have. And that is the question about the 17th century, because it's in the 17th century that it happens. And it's in the 17th century that we attack their ancestors' civilizations in the most totally devastating way. And the Tyrona people are, the cities are, every one of them is completely destroyed. Their inhabitants are all wiped out. Only a remnant of the population survives. And that's what I'm in touch with, is the people who have put something together out of survival, these remnants. That's who the copy are. So it is a question about the 17th century. Their experience of the 17th century is every bit as dramatic, if not even more dramatic, than Europe's experience of the 17th century. It is the same related experience. And so the Kogi offer an opportunity to look at what could have been preserved if we hadn't all gone down the Galilean road. Who are the Kogi? What can they tell us? Not just about themselves, but about us. And what do we need to learn to try to undo the damage that we have done, not to them, but to us, since those years? The Kogi are people who have deliberately preserved a, their identity as a pre-Columbian culture, mm -hmm. as far as they could, um, into our era. They have done this through a deliberate policy of isolation. So they have tried to create as much distance as they possibly could between us and them. There is a frontier. Things cross the frontier, but they try to control what crosses the frontier. Um, they retain language, they retain dress, although the dress is not the same as it was before Columbus, but it's still a traditional costume. Um, and they retain a set of, a way of teaching and understanding the world that is ancestral to them in a most peculiar way. So. They are run by people who are a little like Old Testament judges, spiritual advisors, who are trained, they're called mamas, and the word is related to the sun, so they are enlightened ones. And these people are trained from infancy for between 9 and 18 years in darkness. Uh, this is an unusual way of doing things. Um, so you have people who are shamans, seers, prophets, wise, wise folk who have been raised in the darkness and emerge into the light at 18 uh, and whose whole way of understanding the world is therefore utterly different from ours, um, whose language is also utterly different from ours because they don't, it's much more a platonic language with categories rather than nouns to describe things. Um, they see the world in holistic terms in ways that we don't. They see the world as um, governed by laws given at the beginning of time. They live in a world in which nothing, as far as they know, is ever discovered because all knowledge came in a revelation at the beginning of time. And so all that can happen is that knowledge is lost, never acquired. Um, and they have the responsibility, they were created to do this, uh, of looking after nature. They are nature's guardians. And that's why they survive. They survive because it is their duty to take care of the world. And had they not an absolute belief in that duty, they would have surely disappeared by now. They're a very highly organized, highly structured, highly centralized society um, and extremely proactive. So the thing that really struck me right at the beginning was I had seen television documentaries of indigenous people and 
of the usual statement of the documentary, if not the people, was, we need your help. Help us. The statement of the Kogi was, you need our help. I thought, that's a voice I want to hear. I want to spread that voice in the world. When indigenous people say, you need our help, we need to listen to. So that's, in a nutshell and totally inadequately, who the Kogi are. An agricultural people living close to the land and understanding it and knowing it. Um, so the reason that I was there was that the BBC had asked me to investigate an archaeological site that had been discovered called the Lost City. And they wanted to know if there was a film to be made. And that's when I realized that there were other cities that were occupied. And the thing to do was, therefore, get the inhabitants of the other one of these other cities to explain what a pre-Columban city is, because we've never known. All the pre-Columban cities we know about are archaeological sites, and we invent stories of how they operated. Here's people who are living in pre-Columban cities, so let's ask them, what's it about? How does it work? What do you do? And so, and I knew at the same time that they resisted contact with outsiders, of course. I also knew that they felt responsibility for caring for the world, and I also knew that they were intensely pessimistic. So I sent messages to three Kogi communities saying, if you want to speak to the world, I can help you. I got three messages back six months later, identical, we're waiting to work with you, come. And so I went, and um, they did want to speak. They'd been waiting for this opportunity, and so... I offered them an explanation of what was involved, and ultimately we made a film, which is called From the Heart of the World, The Elder Brother's Warning. And the point of the film was their message, you are destroying the world. We'll show you that you are destroying the world, and you have to stop. The bulk of the film was, because I told them it had to be, their demonstration of the authenticity of their ancestral knowledge. They needed to show that they really are who they say they are so that we believe them and we listen to them. The film was, from that point of view, a triumph. Um, a 90-minute film. It did very well on the BBC. It did very well in the United States. And what it did was to um, overwhelm people with the vision of this mythical society that had emerged and that you really did believe in and do believe in saying here's who we are this is what we say listen to us a very powerful statement and it was just before the rio conference so it was just at a very powerful time as well however it didn't change very much nor did the rio conference and uh eventually uh I mean, I was going to then remain in touch with them, obviously, because I had some responsibility. Right at the start, I'd said, right, you can do this with me, but here's the reasons why you shouldn't. Here are the dangers to you. Now I'll tell you the reasons why you might want to do it, but the dangers are important. And I left it to them, of course, it's their responsibility, their culture, to decide whether they wanted to work with me or not. Um, after that, when they said yes and we made the film, I then clearly had a responsibility to remain in contact because I had opened a door that I had to help them maintain. Uh, and so I had to go back periodically. And after a few years, the question arises, they realize that their initial assumption was wrong. Their assumption had been that we didn't know that we're destroying the world. And that by telling us, we'd stop. And then comes the bewildering fact that it turns out we did know. And we don't care. Something's wrong with us. What has to be done to get us to stop destroying the world? And they run through a series of experiments, which are very interesting experiments, in trying to find ways of helping us understand, getting us to understand that we uh, need to change the way we think. All that fails completely. So then they say, we've, we've got to make another film. We've got to do it. This time, 
the BBC, which had shown the first film, has moved away from showing this kind of a film. And they're not going to give any financial support. And in fact, the whole world of documentary films, certainly Anglo-Saxon documentary films, has changed fundamentally. You cannot get this kind of film onto television at all. And it's very difficult to get it distributed in the cinema either. And the one organization which really goes for it and supports me and wants to help me is IMAX. And that would be fabulous if we could do this and put it on IMAX. But then the head of IMAX says, oh, by the way, I want you to shoot it in 3D because all our documentaries are now 3D. The idea of shooting the Coggy in 3D and all that that involves in terms of equipment and how you do it is just so silly that I abandon it. But we do make the film Aluna. People do come in as shareholders and buy shares in the film. And of course, I tell them, your odds of your losing your money are much higher than your odds of getting the money back. And of course, nobody quite believes it. But it's true. So the return on the money for the people who've invested is negligible. Um, and then everybody decides, actually, let's stop trying to earn money from this film and we'll just put it out on YouTube for free and the whole world ought to see it. So the last few months that's been happening. And this is actually rather good and it means it's possible for people to see the film and it's being seen by thousands of people and its uptake is suddenly getting closer, a little bit closer to what it ought to be. There's a way to go yet. The film is called Aluna and it's there on YouTube, and it might be worth having a look at. The ultimate message of the film from the Coggy Mamas is you don't have to change your life, but you do have to look after the rivers. And that is the truth. And if we don't look after the rivers, we are totally screwed. <laughs>
their ancestral lands are. However, at the same time, there is the development of the, there is the industrialization of the coastal area at the foot of the mountain. And this industrialization involves um, building ports, uh, building factories, uh, and uh, damaging the ecosystems all along the coast at the bottom of the Sierra. Uh, and that damage the ecosystems is essentially the destruction of all the river estuaries at the bottom of the mountain. And there is very little understanding of the impact of destroying estuaries on rivers. Except the Coggy have a very clear understanding of that effect and they are trying constantly to make it clear for people to understand that if you destroy the estuary you destroy the source and if you destroy the source you destroy the entire hydrographic system of the mountain and this is a hydrographic system on which not only the indigenous depend but the two million people who live in cities at the bottom also completely depend and so they're trying to get across that the destruction of what they regard as sacred sites and important places and part of their natural heritage for which they are responsible and have to take care of also will involve the destruction of human life in the colonial society at the foot of the mountain. So their campaign to get the rest of us involved in this is not simply save the indigenous people. It, you live on this planet, you've got to save it. You've got to stop it. Uh, so that's what's going on now. The role that the Tyrona Heritage Trust plays, which is the uh, charity, the NGO that I set up, um, is no longer land purchase because we feel that that is being undertaken by a sufficiently large number of other organizations that there's no point in us putting in our two penny worth. It's more important to convey, help the Coggy convey their message, to provide them with platforms as far as possible and find ways to, to help them express what they're saying, which will enable the rest of the world to listen. <laughs>
Irona gold, the Poggy gold, the gold of South and Central America, which, yes, Columbus went for gold. And just one story about how Columbus understood gold. The Taino people in Hispaniola, Columbus has discovered, have gold. And he sends them in forced, in forced sending to get gold. And he discovers that in order to get it, they have to see the equivalent of their mama. They have to fast for several days. Their men have to live apart from their wives for a month. And then they are purified, cleansed, spiritually in a condition that allows them to get this strange substance from the river, which is where they're getting it from. And we tend to think that Columbus, who has gone with the sole purpose of acquiring gold, that's absolutely clear, regards gold as nothing more than money. So it's a bit of a surprise that he says to his men, they're right, you know, you are going to have to go to mass before you go looking for gold. You are have to go and, to go and consecrate yourself. You have to go through the same kind of spiritual preparation that they do in order to acquire gold. In other words, gold is seen by Columbus also as having this mysterious transcendental power. It's not just money. And of course, what happens to a large part of the gold that goes back from the Americas, where do you see it? Go to Seville Cathedral, have a look at the altar, have a look at the great screen behind the altar. Masses and masses and masses of what was transcendental gold in the hands of the Indians is now transcendental gold in the hands of Europeans, playing the same role of connecting them to something outside the world. The whole role and nature of gold is something which goes far beyond simply being money. At the end of the first film, I asked that question. And I asked, why do they think that any of this matters? Why are they so convinced that they're talking about the end of the world, which is what they are talking about? And so we go close to the top of the mountain to an area called the Paramo. And I sit there and I say, look, looking around here, this is grassland, but all the grass is dead. All the plants are withered. The Kogi know that everything below here depends on this for its life. This is where the water comes from that sustains everything below this point. So when this dies, finally, everything below it will die. It has no choice. There's no option. That's it. And this isn't just a question of the Sierra. This is our lives. And then a coggy voice comes on and says, we know what you've done. You've sold the clouds. And I can't think of a better way of expressing what's happened.